Good evening, everyone. I apologize for the loss of my video, but we're going to go ahead and get this meeting started. Thank you for joining us this evening. I call this June 29th, 2022 meeting of the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority to order. Vice Chair O'Malley is excused and all other members are present this evening via video conference. Notice uh, is hereby given that the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority met at 4 p.m. this afternoon for a closed meeting to discuss pending litigation proceedings. The meeting was held vid video via video conference. The matters discussed in the closed meeting were limited to only those specified in the notice. In the notice, thank you. Um, I need a motion and a second to approve this statement to be included as part of the minutes and go to and go into open session. So is there a second? Second. So there's a second, um, a motion and a second. And I think the second was by um, Mr. Rayel. Um, Ms. Carion, can you please call the roll? Councillor Fievelkorn. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Chair Pena. Yes. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Commissioner Quesada. Aye. Member Rael. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Carion. Um, next, we have the um, moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. And if we can have the um, pledge led by um, Mr. Rael. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America States. and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Royale. Uh, next is item three, approval of the minutes. I make a motion to approve the May 18th, 2022 minutes. Is there a second? Second. There's um, a motion and a second. Ms. Carion, can you please call the roll? Councillor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Chair Pena? Yes. Commissioner Piscotti? Aye. Commissioner Casada? Aye. Member Rael? Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, next item is item four, proclamations and awards are none, so we'll move on to item five, public comment. Ms. Carion, do we have anyone signed up to speak? So we have um, two speakers. Thank you. So the speakers will have three minutes with a two and a half minute um, warning. Ms. Carion, would you please call the first speaker? Give me one moment. The first speaker will be Santiago Maestas. Mr. Maestas, you have two minutes to speak. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Santiago Maestas, I'm uh, president of the uh, South Valley Regional Association of Acequias and a member of the MRGCD uh, Conservation Advisory. <clears throat> Advisory Committee. Uh, I'd like to give you uh, all an update, members of the board and Madam Chair, on the MRGCD leasing and following program. The uh, Conservation Advisory Committee uh, met on June uh, the 22nd of uh, this year. Uh, the final enrollment figures were 2,554.4 acres for a total uh, cost of $1,085,620. Uh, each uh, acre uh, will uh, be paid $425 for the season. The uh, Coach T Division, which is uh, our farthest north uh, division, uh, enrolled 22.41 acres. The Albuquerque Division, enrolled 
273.72 acres. The Belen Division, which is the largest, enrolled 1,749.1 acres. The Socorro Division enrolled 509.09 acres. Total irrigators enrolled were 190. The median acreage enrolled was 6.54 acres. This is a, a statement on the uh, introduction uh, to the MRGCD leasing, leasing and following program. In response to interest from small acreage irrigators, the district has allowed lease applicants to enroll a minimum of one acre of actively irrigated land in this program. The district and our partners, which include the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Audubon Society, have agreed to a commitment to enroll 3,200 acres in the environmental water leasing program in 2022. Additionally, due to extreme drought, anticipated water shortages, and the Rio Grande Compact debits, the MRGCD received $15 million from the state of New Mexico for emergency following program through 2025 for the next three years. With the funding and administrative requirements of the two programs, only full season lease options were offered in 2022. Can you test that for three minutes? Thank you very uh, much. Uh, I have submitted uh, the remaining uh, comments in uh, writing uh, for the uh, consideration, Madam uh, Chair. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elaine Hebbard. Elaine, you will have two minutes to speak. Can you hear me? Or, I'm sorry, three minutes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hooray for the rain. And thank you for opening up the public comment to accept oral input as well as written. Next step, hopefully, hybrid meetings. And I've submitted written comments, um, which I understand have already been submitted, uh, sent around, but I'd like to have them to the record, please. The early onset of the monsoon season in the past week has translated into May five times the normal rainfall for June, but that doesn't get us out of the hole we've already dug for ourselves. The, the drought map in item 10A shows that 52% of New Mexico was experiencing the worst category of drought, exceptional drought last week and the week before. Drought actions this year have included, as Mr. Maesta said, um, MRGCD announcing to its customers that they were out of water. ABCWA stopped diverting wa surface water altogether on June 17th. Farmers are reverting to pumped groundwater if they have wells, all of which are adding to additional flow depletions. Rescues of silvery minnow <clears throat> eggs were initiated in case the river dried up through the city, and deliveries under the Rio Grande Compact have been less than required for the past three years, with the state owing 127,000 acre feet at the end of 2021. And as of May, we had underdelivered by an additional 30,000 acre feet. That can be made up. We know that the 20 year mega drought we are experiencing is what, as we see snowpacks being less, runoff being earlier, the Rio Grande flows declining. While the impacts of climate change are already visible, the projections are for hotter temperatures, less snowpack, and more water use. Since the MRGCD, sorry, the ABCWA represents about and its other urban users, about 27% of the regional water use, it certainly has a major role to play in reducing the overconsumption of our apportionment under the Rio Grande Compact. As such, some recommendations. Given the rapidity of climate changes already happening, educate the public as to impacts and possible ways to adapt. Report data to the public and the board justifying the need for additional actions. Two, our new normal is not merely a drought, or a temporary condition. Address the obvious climatic changes in a systemic fashion. Include a plan for utilizing monsoon resources. Three, 
rejoin the basin study, a regional effort to come up with solutions approved by this board in C-2032, but staff left evidently because of a lack of staff. Four, join with others to develop a geospatial water budget model for use by land users and water planners. Five, every project should be based upon whether or not river flow depletions are increased. If so, countermeasures must be put into place to reduce them with the aim of reducing depletions over time. Six, plan to achieve net zero in Can water consumption. Three minutes? Just thank you. I have the rest. Just one more. Uh, well, anyway, net zero in thank water you. production. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Does, does that conclude um, public comment? Ms. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so now we are on announcements and communication. Our next scheduled meeting it will be August 17th at 5 p.m. via video conference. And then the other announcement announcement is technical customer advisory committee vacancy there the vacancy on the technical customer advisory committee if board members have any nominations please direct them to the online app on the water authority's website at www.abcwua.org so <coughs> next we are on uh, item seven introduction of legislation there is none so now a consent agenda and um Mr. Sanchez, is there anything you wanted to do? If not, I would um, make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. There's a motion in the second. Ms. Carrion, can you please call the roll? Councilor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Chair Pena? Yes. Commissioner Piscotti? Aye. Commissioner Quesada? Aye. Member Ryle? Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. We're now on approvals, which is E2224, approval of the 2022 collective bargaining agreement between the local 624 of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees and the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority. Mr. Marcus. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, before you is a approval of a ratification of an agreement with local 624, which uh, represents our blue collar employees. This is a three year agreement. The first year would provide 5% increase in wages. The second year, a 2% increase. You ready to go? Third year, a 2%. In addition, go, first year would provide a $1,000 lump sum payment. Mom, I don't want Second you to... year, a $750 lump sum payment. And Mr. Sanchez, can you can you hold on one second? I think um, sure. Mr. Maestas' speaker is on. I can hear him speaking. Fix it, we're good. Thank you. You can perce proceed, Mr. Okay. Sanchez. Okay, so uh, first year, 5%, second year, 2%, third year, 2%. And each year, there'd be a lump sum non-recurring payment. First year is $1,000, second year, $750, and third year, $500. I'd stand for any questions. Are there any questions? And if there is, Ms. Carrion, can you please, I cannot see the um, hands raised from my phone. No questions. Okay. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Sanchez, for working with the, with the, uh, you to get something that was ratified by, by the union. And uh, although we always want to do more, uh, I think that you've done a, a great job um, working in good faith with unions. Thank you with that. I would make motion to approve C-2224. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Ms. Carrion, would you please call the roll? Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Chair Pena. Yes. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Commissioner Casada. Aye. Member Ryle. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Under approvals, we are now on B, 2224 approval of the 2022 um, memorandum of agreement between local 2962 of the um, 
American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees and Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, this um, agreement is with Local 2962, which represents our clerical employees, and the wage package is exactly the same as the one I just went through with the uh, blue collar employees. I'd stand for any questions. Are there any questions, Ms. Carrion? No one's hand raised, no. Thank you. And I guess the comments would remain the same. Um, thank you again, Mr. Sanchez. And I would make a motion for approval of C2225. Is there a second? Second. Oh, second. There's a motion and a second by Councillor Jones and Mr. Rael. Um, Ms. Carrion, would you please call the roll? Councillor Feeblecorn? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Chair Pena? Yes. Commissioner Piscotti? Aye. Commissioner Casada? Aye. Member Ryle? Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we move on to C2226, approval of contract with Royal Engineer for um, P2022 uh, five or six zeros nine bus rescue project preliminary engineering basis of design reports. Miss Ann. Are we? Ms. Anderson, Luce? Yes, let me get her. Oh, there it goes. Sorry, I didn't realize I needed to unmute myself. And I can start my <laughs> video. Okay, there I am. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, well, second time around is even better than the first, right? So um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, today I'm bringing to you this um, with a recommendation for approval of this um, this contract that we'd like to issue with Corolo engineers, it's the completion of our request for proposals. We'll be using funding um, to, to complete this Bosque water reuse project. Um, this is just the preliminary design that we'll be doing um, through the basis of design report, but we'll be using ARPA funds from Bernalillo County. So I just wanted to say thank you to the county again for those funds to use towards this project. It's a very important part. Um, it's the foundation, one of the foundation projects of Water 2120. It'll be providing reused water on the west side of Albuquerque. Um, there's still a big, uh, you know, a lot of funding we need to get together to build the project, but this will get us a long way in design. So we'll be using ARPA funds and capital outlay. And um, the fiscal impact of this is 3 million two hundred and sixty six thousand seven hundred and fifty four dollars excluding New Mexico gross receipts tax um, but the funding will be coming from ARPA and capital outlay and um, I would recommend approval and I stand for any questions okay Ms. Carrion are there any questions uh, madam madam chair just one question maybe for uh, Ms., uh, for uh, Mark is uh, this project going to um, impact uh the BEMP program that uh, that this, that's currently being offered by the Bosca school or does it augment it or is there any impact at all to it uh, madam chair mr Rial, it does not impact the BEMP program uh we continue to support that and partner with them in any way but this this facility will be co-located with Bosque prep school All right, thank you. Okay, any additional questions? No, no. okay. So thank you. I know when we had the um, first reading on this legislation, there was a lot of good information provided and the fact that it is on the, I think that you're gonna work with the school to create some type of program, it was my understanding or am I, um, understanding that incorrectly, Mr. Sanchez? Uh, Madam Chair, that's correct. Uh, part of the agreement with being co-located with Bosque Prep School is we would have the equivalent of a biology lab 
on that campus for Bosque Prep School and other high school students to use. Yeah, so so my, my memory does once in a while serve me correctly. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think that's going to be great for those students. And um, again, the water authority, you know, just about one of the pieces of legislation that we talked about earlier do, during you know, storage, reinjection, using um, non potable water to water our parks, you know, and the reuse. I think the Water Authority, obviously, I'm always touting um, the good work that you guys do there. So thank you. With that, um, I would uh, move approval of C2220. Is there a second? Second. Second from Quesada and Rael. So, um, Ms. Carrion, would you please call the roll? Councilor Fiebelcorn. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Chair Pena. Yes. Commissioner Piscotti. Aye. Commissioner Casada. Aye. Member Rael. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. So now we're on C2227 approval of contract with affordable solar installation incorporated to finance, construct, own, and operate and sell electricity to the authority from a solar energy facility at the San Juan Chama raw pump station for P2022-000013. Ms. Anderson again. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is a project that it's really exciting. We've been working very closely with the city open space and the county um, to, to create this project where we're going to be installing solar um, on the Alameda open space. It's going to be installed as covered parking which I think will be um, really popular for visitors there. And it'll be providing solar to um, the raw water pump station, which is what moves water up the hill to our surface water treatment plant. Um, so it's a great project. It's a power purchase agreement, similar to what we've done with our other solar projects. And I recommend approval and stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Ms. Carrion, are there any questions? No. Okay. Well, with that, I would move. Madam Chair, I apologize. I hit the wrong button. May I interrupt <laughs> for one Rayo. second? Thanks, yeah. Madam Chair. Uh, can you guys just tell me a little bit about what the uh, financial structure is with uh, Direct Solar um, as it relates to the construction and the and and then the uh, sale of the solar is uh, generated from the project? So this is a. Power purchase agreement. Um, we we contract with Affordable Solar. They install the um, they install the power. They install the solar, and then we have a set rate that we use to pay for the power. And in the long run, the um, the balance shows that we actually get a, a better rate on the energy than we would if we were buying it directly from PNM. So it winds up being a, a positive impact on the budget. Um, Is there, uh, Madam Chair, if I could make, ask a follow up? Yeah, um, is the is the uh, project going to generate a, di a more solar, uh, if you will, power than what you need? And do they sell the additional power to PNM, or is it all just exclusively straight, just for the use of the water authority? The um, the the land that's available there to do the project um, is only enough to provide a portion of the power needed for the raw water pump station. So it's there won't be additional power to sell. It will fully go towards the pump station. Well, Madam Chair, I, I would say that, you know, we're really excited about this project at the city because obviously that's one of the most popular areas for hikers and bikers and everybody else in between that likes to go, including moi. I do that area once in a while and uh, it's really, a, um, and I've had a lot of folks ask me about the project because I think a lot of folks have heard about it. So uh, thank you all for uh, for moving that project forward. It's I think it's a good amenity for the area and uh, and obviously it's all about uh, making sure we're looking into the future as it relates to our sustainability and what better way to use it. Council Commissioner Casada and I were just talking about earlier and, and Councillor Jones about what a nice day we have today and it's all because we have sunshine and we might as well use it to our best of our abilities. So thank you very much on the project. Thank you. It also provides us a great opportunity to do some education and outreach down there. So we're working with the open space on messaging that's going to be included uh, in the area, which gets a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of people visiting, as you said, so we're excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions, Ms. Carrion? 
You know, ma'am. Well, with that, um, I would move approval as 227. Is there a second? A second. There's a second, but um, Mr. Rael and Councilor Feeble, Ms. Carrion, would you please? Councilor Feeble, Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Chair Pena? I'll come back. Commissioner Piscotti? Aye. Commissioner Quesada? Aye. Member Rael? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. That passes unanimously. Okay. Now we are we are on D under approval, C twenty twenty eight approval of contract with S W A for E twenty twenty two zero 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 ten. Um, SWRP outfall restoration project. Anderson, once again. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, this is another contract that's being brought to you for approval. Um, we've been busy. So this one is a, um, a habitat project that we're constructing or uh, that we're currently designing to go. It'll be located at the outfall of our wastewater treatment plant where the waste, the treated wastewater enters the river. Um, this will provide habitat for the silvery minnow, and we're doing it in conjunction with the Office of the Natural Resources Tr Trustee um, that is providing funding that, the, you know, the project will also be doing, you know, water quality improvements for the river by restoring riparian vegetation, and it'll be um, creating some, some trails. So we're working with the city um, open space again on some trails for the area. Um, there's a lot of great benefits and multiple partners on this project. So we're really looking forward to moving forward with the design, which at this point is being funded with capital outlay. Um, and I recommend approval and stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, Ms. Carriona, any uh, questions? Madam Chair, I, make, I recommend approval. Second. Motion second for approval. I'll, well, Ms. Carrion, would you please call the roll? Councillor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Chair Pena? Welcome back. Commissioner Piscotti? Aye. Commissioner Quesada? Aye. Member Rael? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, that passes unanimously. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. Now we are in, um, under F, under approval, C22 contract with our MCI um, incorporated as a result of um, B2222-005 HAP construction um, number 0735, Ms. Anderson. I think this is the one of the for you. I think this is my last one. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, <laughs> members of the board. Um, this is another contract for approval. Um, this is a um, more another project that's being funded through the ARPA funds from Burnley County, which again, we're very grateful for. Um, we'll be completing the rehabilitation of the Teharis Interceptor, which is a, a very large wastewater pipeline that runs through Kirtland Air Force Base. So we've been working very closely with Kirtland on getting that design and constructed, and they're very excited to get this, this work completed as well. Um, and it, again, is being funded through ARPA funds, and I recommend approval and stand for any questions. Are th Madam Chair, Madam Chair, this right. is, uh, thank you. Madam Chair, um, first and foremost, this project is really a super important project for the, for the base. and. And it obviously uh, one that had come to the city before they understood that they had to go to the water authority. So glad you guys are doing this project. Just a couple of questions, and I think you guys have solved it, but just so that the members of the community know the, if you will, the world that you all have to work in when you're working with uh, the federal government, especially in a federal military installation. One is the cost of the project, the total cost to do the work. And then the other piece is the ownership of the asset once the work is done. And um, and maybe the last piece of it is, is, is there any opportunity to use this particular asset for any future growth? 
if you will, to the south as it relates to Mesa del Sol. All right. Um, so the cost of the project, I'm looking here on the bids. It was fully funded by ARPA and the awarded amount, the total base bid was um, $10,311,751.22. And that's in the staff report here. Um, the project is going to be owned and operated by the Water Authority. Um, we have an easement that we're working on updating again with Kirtland, but we we have the easement that that resides on Kirtland property. And then um, the third question being, does it does it um, look for any future growth? You know, the interceptor is sized at the size that it needs to be to um, to provide you know service to the the southeast heights area and um, the service area that it currently serves and anything that might get built out, we believe. But we do have plans to install a reuse um, plant on the site. We've been working with Kirtland to acquire 24 acres to install a, the Tejeres reuse plant that would be located um, just close to Mesa del Sol on, on Kirtland property there on the, um, the eastern, no, the western edge of the property. So that would certainly support, you know, the future needs for reuse in the area. Uh, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for that. And congrats to to Mark and to you all on the Water Authority. Look, we long ago in a former life of being in City Hall and Mark having a different position, he and I often attempted to try and get Kirtland Air Force Base to come into uh, be part of the water system, et cetera, just simply because um, they're a major user of our water or the uh, we, we take all of their wastewater in those days. And it was always a real challenge because of this federal designation. So glad you all were able to work this agreement out with them. Um, it'll certainly help, obviously, the long-term sustainability of the of the facility there, the military facility, but also it does have a great uh, use for the southeast part of the city. So uh, thanks for the for the good work. And with that, Madam Chair, I would move approval of the agreement. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Casada. Um, with Ms. Carrion, will you please call the roll? Councilor Fiegelkorn? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Chair Pena? Yes. Commissioner Piscotti? Aye. Commissioner Casada? Aye. Member Ryle? Yes. Passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, Ms. Carrion. So we are on, on our final item this evening other business. We have OB 2212, our drought update. Mr. Bustos, you've been working hard. You brought us a lot of rain, Sam. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, yes, what a blessing is the rain. Uh, it all happened while I was on vacation, so it wasn't me. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> uh, so that's good. Mother Nature got our back. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, we'll jump into the drought update and uh, dry and windy weather with low humidity had been uh, uh, occurring here or affecting New Mexico all the way through mid-June. Uh, since then, uh, uh, the last part of June, uh, the Albuquerque area received over 2.4 inches of rain. Uh, that uh, basically puts us at a stage where uh, we're a little bit above normal for this time of the year. So June uh, was definitely above normal and we'll be talking a little bit about that in another slide. Uh, still 90% of the state is experiencing extreme drought conditions. Uh, fire conditions have improved in the last two weeks, thanks in part uh, to those rains. Uh, we're, but still many families are affected by the huge fires that spread through thousands of acres, especially in northern New Mexico. We thank all our firefighters for the work that they're doing in preserving lands and homes. And we're taking rain because it also helped with the mitigation efforts. We owe for continual monsoon to help with drought conditions. We continue to be in drought watch within our service area. And, and people are responding well uh, to our drought measures. Uh, our UBCD is currently at 128. Uh, last year, 
at the same time, it was at 1.30. It, so that, that tells the story of how people are responding. And next slide. Uh, the summer outlook is somewhat deceiving. If we were to like uh, think about the last two weeks and how much rain and we're supposed to be getting a little bit more uh, in the next uh, couple of days. Uh, nevertheless, it's still looking like uh, temperatures are gonna be above normal and precipitation is somewhat below or uh, there's equal chances, if you will, of receiving a normal or above or below normal uh, rain events. Next slide. Uh, I updated this chart uh, with the latest data in your package. The graph uh, only shows up to June 12th. Uh, this chart shows this year's uh, temperature ranges for the Albuquerque area until June 27. And just to give you a little bit description of the graph, uh, the normal temp temperature range is shown in brown. Uh, the blue line is the observed 2022 temperatures, and red indicates a record max, and light blue is record lows. This year, we've had four record-breaking heat days, April 5th, May 15th, and back-to-back -back days on June 10th and June 11th, when we hit 101 degrees. Since then, temperatures for Albuquerque have been between 64 degrees and 84 degrees, uh, the normal high for this time of year is 92 degrees. And you can see that dip at the end in the graph. Next chart. Uh, I also updated this graph uh, with the latest data in your package. The graph only shows up to June 12th. Uh, this chart shows precipitation uh, accumulation for Albuquerque since the start of the year until June 27. Since the start, um, before the last two weeks of, of June, uh, Albuquerque had only received uh, less than an inch of rain. Then came June with a strong monsoon season start. Uh, June recorded 2.38 inches and in the airport and uh, some areas of Albuquerque got up to 2.6 inches. In just two weeks of rain. The normal for June is 0.57 inches. Uh, we are seeing reductions because of this, especially in supplemental irrigation. Uh, as I mentioned, people respond well uh, to drop measures. They also respond well. We also respond well to weather events. Whenever we get more rain, uh, supplemental irrigation dips, and we're seeing an average daily demand of 30 million gallons less compared to the last two years for this time period. Next slide. Uh, this chart shows the flows uh, for Albuquerque or the estimated anticipated flows in the green line. Uh, spring runoff in 2022 happened earlier than what we saw in 2021. Uh, we did not get the spring precipitation in 2022, which means we saw lower flows earlier at the central gauge. Uh, surface water diversions are currently halt and there are no plans to start things up back in July. Even with the monsoon season rains, flows in the river at Central have been too low for us to operate. Uh, since shutting down on June 16, uh, there's been consecutive days where uh, the threshold uh, has, has been lower uh, than 122 CFS, uh, which means we shut down at the right time. A uh, start of the surface water treatment plan is planned for uh, later on uh, in September, but it's all based on flows. Uh, flows in the river will continue to decline unless we continue to have a good monsoon season. Uh, so uh, every rain chant, every rain dance, uh, let's continue to do that uh, so we can continue to have a good strong monsoon. Uh, monsoon rains are also supporting MRUCD diversions and are currently enough to keep the river connected down to Elephant Butte. Next slide. Uh, operations during low flow conditions uh, uh, require uh, 
has, has two primary uses of surface water. We got the drinking water supply source, and then we got the irrigation for uh, the nor north non potable system, which uh, includes uh, irrigating uh, the Balloon Fiesta Park and other large uh, users. Uh, both uses require minimum flows in the river. Uh, this picture, uh, the one above, shows uh, the Alameda gauge when it was a 95 CFS in September 2021, and we weren't using surface water flow. Uh, operations of the drinking water plant requires flow in the river to be at 122 CFS. Uh, the north non potable irrigation uses untreated San Juan Chama surface water. And whenever we shut down a uh, this both systems, it increases the use of groundwater. Next slide. With that uh, comes conservation and drought action planning. Uh, we are currently in drought watch. Uh, drought watch uh, uh, requires us to mitigate and manage demand uh, in times of drought uh, by implementing uh, measures. Uh, the measures that we're currently implementing are the drop classes. Uh, we're doubling our water waste fees. We have a lot more folks in the field uh, patrolling and investigating and following up on water waste cases. And we've also uh, doubled our seriscape rebate amount to $2 per square foot. Uh, the seriscape, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, the impact of some of these measures in further slides. Uh, other things we're doing is that uh, we're, we have and continue to implement a program for low-income uh, uh, customers. Uh, we're also working with HOAs. Right now, we're working with six HOAs. Our goal is to work with them to implement long-term plans and on conceptualized plans to reduce water uh, in, in the open spaces that they manage. And as I mentioned, we have an increased uh, enforcement staff. Uh, we're also reviewing uh our our drought plan as we go through this drought to ensure that we're looking at uh, our historical data uh, future supply demand projections and all the different weather variables and learning from this current drought uh, also reviewing uh, national regional international guides to make sure that we're following the best bmps when it comes to responding to drought next slide So uh, as I mentioned, one of our drop uh, measures uh, for drop watch is implementing drop classes. Uh, to date, we've taught uh, classes to over nine, nine, 1,900 uh, people. And the average class is, is about 80 to 100 people per class. And we're still teaching those classes online. And so I think that's benefit for people to like uh, join at lunchtime. It's only one hour and we offer a $20 rebate. And by teaching people how to water effectively with a hose, sprinkler, or drip system, or helping them identify some of the issues that are happening whenever they turn on irrigation systems, and helping them select the right type of plants and trees, uh, people have, that have joined our class have conserved over 4.2 million gallons uh, to date. Uh, the average household is reducing their water footprint by 5.6%. Uh, this is fascinating to see uh, that we can, uh, uh, if you will, touch uh, people's uh, uh, and persuade them to conserve water uh, by spending one hour and providing good education on, on conservation and efficiency measures in, in the landscape. Next slide. Uh, the other uh, measure that uh, we're implementing is that uh, under the drop watch, the fees for waterways uh, double. Uh, you'll see in my next slide uh, some of the impact that that's having and the activities that that's producing. Uh, please uh, note that before we do issue a violation to any of our customers, they, they, they get two opportunities uh, to work with us on fixing and remediating the situation. And we can connect them with some of our uh, programs or rebates, et cetera, to make sure that uh, the situation ultimately gets solved. Uh, that's our goal. Our goal has never been to issue a, a, a violation. At least it's not the goal right now. 
Uh, the goal is to fix the situation. And next slide. Since we enacted the drought watch in March 2021, we've had a total of 1,362 complaints uh, from customers. Uh, we've issued over 590 warnings, performed over 3,000 inspections, and identified over 885 malfunctions. Uh, out of these, only 75 violations uh, are, have been uh, issued to date. Uh, out of, a result from these activities, we're seeing 45.5 million gallons saved to date. Uh, the warning letters alone uh, conserve 33 million gallons. So that, that serves to show that whenever we, we engage with customers, after uh, they've been informed of a waterways, uh, folks respond. Uh, we want to do the right thing. It just serves to help uh, help us identify whenever there's an issue in our irrigation system. Uh, we currently have about 100 uh, waterways cases open. Uh, we have uh, six people actively working in the field to follow up with waterways uh, complaints and concerns. Uh, as we move into July and August, uh, we anticipate that uh, there's going to be more water waste complaints and, and, and we have the resources in place to uh, respond to those. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all for doing your part in conserving water and I stand for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? I see any, but it uh, Mr. Bustos, thanks for helping to bring the rain for leaving town and the rain coming or whatever it took as long as we've got it. So I appreciate um, all your work. And, and I just a quick little question. So still under like I think time it was said, um, you know, we're at an all time low of terms of usage as 128 per gallon. Are we still there? Uh, right now we're at a 128 EPCD. Uh, which is uh, aligned with our grant uh, goals, if you will, uh, of what we're trying to achieve this year. And uh, I think that if we were to continue having a good monsoon rain and based on the measures and how people are responding, uh, I, I can anticipate a lower UPCD by the end of the year. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank yeah. you again. Thank you, with Madam that, Chair. We'll we will move on to OB 2213, 50 year water plan status plus next steps. Mr. Smith Peterson, Director, Interstate um, Stream Commission. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking with you here today about a governor's initiative for the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission um, that I'm gonna talk about in a, in a, at a pretty high level today um, and give you a, a, a feeling of what um, the work we've been doing and, um, and, and essentially what we're hearing from research experts about the science of climate change um, and the impacts of climate change and expectations that all New Mexicans should have over the next 50 years. Um, can I get the next slide here as we're going along? So uh, let me let me start by saying, you know, that uh, uh, as director of uh, New, the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission, I report to a nine member appointed commission. And I really want to thank Director uh, Sanchez uh, on the line today. He is the chair of the Interstate Stream Commission and has been in a commissioner role there for well over a decade and has provided great advice and leadership for the Interstate Stream Commission. We have about 45 authorized staff. We are a, a state agency that's a program under the Office of the State Engineer. And in that regard, uh, I work and my staff work daily with the Office of the State Engineer. On, on this slide on the far right hand side, um, you'll see kind of a high level list of uh, work activities of the Interstate Stream Commission. And while I'm talking today about our 50 year water plan, 
there are many more things that we do. The water planning piece of it is a, is a relatively small part of our portfolio. Um, but within New Mexico, for the state as a whole, uh, all of you are aware, and you know, from some of the discussion that I heard early on for the meeting here and then the drought watch, you know, well attuned to the fact that New Mexico is semi-arid to desert in many parts of the state. Uh, we have very few perennial rivers, Rio Grande largely being one, uh, but most of our streams are ephemeral. Uh, we get most of our surface water from the mountains that are to the north of Albuquerque for the Rio Grande, for the Pecos, um, for the Canadian River System and for the San Juan River System, our bigger, the, the biggest rivers within New Mexico. 80% um, of the surface water that comes into New Mexico that's available for our use comes from those northern mountains. So really big, significant piece of it. Um, love the monsoons myself. They definitely help, you know, dampen demand. Wonderful to have with reduced temperatures and so on. From a water supply standpoint, um, boy, they could be as much as 40% to the precipitation, but perhaps 10 to 20% of the surface water supply. Um, so wonderful to have it, hard to plan and work around that. Um, relative to water use within the state, I, I refer to the far left side of this graphic, and you can see for the state of New Mexico as a whole, where water is used. And this is the where water is diverted from a stream, pulled from it or from groundwater. And within that framework for the entire state, over 75% of our human water use is for irrigated agriculture, um, about 10% for public water supplies, including the water authority. 6% um, is livestock, commercial, industrial, mining power. This would include oil and gas operations, that type of thing in our south east area, west parts of the state. Uh, and then we lose about 7% of the state's water annually for evaporation, largely from reservoirs. Um, I wanted to remark on a, a little bit of one of the comments by one of Ralph. Did we lose him, Luz? His audio dropped off. I can still see he's in the meeting. However, the video is turned off in one moment. Okay. Hello, uh, excuse me, did I, uh, I, seems like I got disconnected, am I back? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, not sure exactly where I left off, but uh, just given the time, I'll move on to the next slide. All right, let me, let me say a little bit about our 50-year planning effort. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is an initiative uh, and a directive by Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham to the Interstate Stream Commission to, um, to look forward 50 years with peer-reviewed science and give us an idea of what our water supply, water, well, the overall water use and water supply framework may look like at that time period compared to today. And in doing that, the governor um, provided us really three main overarching um, uh, goals or, or to, to assess and, 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 and really move forward with. And those were really stewardship, sustainability, and equity, as you see on the right-hand side here, or the right middle of this presentation. 
Uh, within that, she also uh, directed us and asked us to do significant outreach across New Mexico and develop partnerships for on the ground expertise in water use. The difference between really the science and the research elements of water and water use versus what people do on the ground. Um, so within that, we have a number of partners that we've engaged with um, that I'll talk about briefly. We have a report, a scientific report that we call the Leap Ahead Report, which is developed by the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. And that was a report that was developed by them and a, a volunteer group largely of scientists uh, at universities across New Mexico who have anywhere from 20 to 40 years of experience doing research in New Mexico and publishing that research. Then we did a, a process that we call the resilience assessment. This is outreach across New Mexico to stakeholders and water users uh, seeking to get their input on that science and, uh, and to assess vulnerabilities um, to increasing temperatures and dryness and, uh, and levels of resilience. And then from all of that to develop recommendations. Um, there's a status and next steps that I'll talk about and I'll go into questions and comments too. Next slide. So I mentioned, you know, what the plan is about. And, uh, and it really is to help New Mexico plan for climate change to our water supplies. Um, the audience here is decision makers in the general public, and that includes all of you board members. Um, the document may be uh, a little bit longer than anybody, um, a decision maker may generally look at. We're largely looking at maybe 50 pages uh, total within that for the entire state. But the idea is bottom line up front and uh, we'll get the main point out right up front and then the detail will follow from it. And, um, and we're gonna really try to summarize needs and recommendations for improving water resilience. And by that, I mean um, the ability to, um, to basically survive a shock to um, an expectation of a water use and to recover it from it quickly with minimal negative impacts to that socially, culturally, economically. You know, what, what this plan is not is the next version of our state water plan, which the ISC also has responsibilities for. That report, um, the state water plan report will be coming out in 2023. It's also not a regional water plan. I think many of you are aware of the 16 regions in New Mexico and the water plans that have been developed by them. It, it's not a technical report. We got lots of appendices here that are very technical. This report will not be that. It, it won't be all gloom and doom. Uh, the messages, the science messages are pretty dire, I have to say, but there's lots of good work being done in New Mexico that we're seeking to highlight. Um, it won't solve all of our state's water problems, and our intent is it's a living document. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned partners that are uh, working with us in development of this plan because it's not just about the Interstate Stream Commission uh, and our uh, group of technical um, individuals with their backgrounds. It's about water across New Mexico and there's lots of expertise out there. So we, as I mentioned, we have the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources and their volunteer experts. We have a significant amount of engagement with the New Mexico Indian Affairs Department. And then through that uh, tribal water work group that are, have representatives from all of New Mexico's tribes, pueblos, and nations. Um, all the other state uh, natural resources agencies, um, Office of the State Engineer, Energy and Minerals Natural Resources, the Environment Department, Department of Ag, Department of Game and Fish, uh, Homeland Security, also um, Department of Health and um, and and Tourism, and uh, I think I'm not sure what EDD is for that matter right there looking at it. But um, we have uh, engagement by the New Mexico Water Dialogue, the New Mexico Water Resources Research Institute out of New Mexico State University, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So a broad uh, group of stakeholders with much experience in water. Next. 
Okay, so I'll get into a little bit of the meat of the uh, of the document, and the the highlight at the the very beginning with beginning, which I don't think is a surprise to any of you, that New Mexico's water future is drier, with a more variable water supply. The the graph that you see in front of you uh, that shows a year since 1930 up through 2020, and then temperature on the far left, uh, you know, average temperature for the state, 51 to 57, is actual data for the state of New Mexico since 1930, averaged and pulled together. The, um, the individual points are years, uh, the lines are 10-year averages um, through that overall data. And I, th I think it's pretty, pretty quick and pretty easy to see that there is a significant trend in temperature since uh, just the late 1980s um, to present and ongoing, where the, both the average temperature over 10 years and many of the annual temperatures are increasing. And in fact, you know, for the, the time I've been in New Mexico, which starts around 1988, uh, most years since that time have been above average, long-term average temperature, and every year, it's an increase in temperature. That, that's not the same with precipitation. If you look back all the way to the 1930s in the blue line piece of this, what you see is that uh, there's, there's quite a bit of variability in um, precip precipitation. In fact, there's these very large cycles that go anywhere from 30 to 50 years of wet to dry, um, but you don't see the same kind of trend. You, you do see the decrease in precipitation that we've experienced since that very wet period in the 1980s, um, but that's really not out of bounds with the longer term historical record. So what we have going on here is about the same kinds of precipitation across our state that we've seen historically, but increasing temperatures. What you see on the graphic is about a two and a half to three degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature over that last 35 years, the scientific kind of consensus is we should expect about five degrees more increase in temperature over the next 50 years, somewhere in that range. And, um, and with increasing temperature um, and a relatively stable water supply, lots of things happen. Next slide. And, and across the board in a semi-arid area, when I talk about lots of things happening, they're generally things that use more water and they result in less water being available for human uses. Um, the, the expectation that we're, we've been told and that will be in our report is even with variable precipitation, expect somewhere about a 20% reduction in surface water supplies. Um, you know, over that that kind of recorded time period, and um, and about a 20 to 25 percent increase in demand of plants at the same time, and so if you put those two things together, you're looking at potentially uh, you know 30 to 40 percent reduction in availability of water for uses across the state. Now that that message is the same message that should be. Um, out there across the western United States. New Mexico, Albuquerque are in the same situation as all of the parties that you see from Texas here, west all the way out to California, going north at least to Wyoming. Um, the, the areas that should expect more moisture are the e areas east of the Mississippi that get a lot of water already. Likelihood, as we've already been seeing, is they will get more, we will get less. And so what do we do with that information? Next slide. And, and I'll just you know, cut to the chase on part of it. What we did is we, we did a series of um, outreach webinars and surveys to water users across the state in something over 20 different webinars, um, a, um, a meeting of the annual meeting of the Water Resource Research Institute, uh, the New Mexico Water Dialogue, and so on, and um, and we we pulled out information from them that related to where they felt like they were vulnerable or most vulnerable, and um, and where um, 
they felt like they were resilient, that they could withstand shocks and what factors kind of pulled out from that, that really rose to the top. And the five that you are here that are on this graphic um, really depict the main ones that we have pulled out as being really important across New Mexico. And I'll start at the top. And if you, you look at the graphic and the overlap there, that the main point that's there is that if you're doing all of these things and you're doing them together, you, you have a hard, higher likelihood of greater resilience, greater ability to withstand this uh, a shock to the system and be able to recover for it. So the first thing is water diversity. Um, how many sources of water does a user or an entity have access to and the rights to? Um, your staff can say a lot about how the Water Authority has diversified its sources, and I would point to them as a, a great example of a party that has done that. Um, water availability is the next. I mean, you can have water rights or you can have sources of water, but if it's a shallow aquifer, um, if the surface water supply is suspect, um, maybe that overall resilience is a little bit less. What's your infrastructure capacity? Um, you know, is that uh, infrastructure sufficient to be able to um, switch from one water use to another one? Um, when the demand and the need is there. Um, watershed health, um, I, I can't say this enough, but we, again, we rely on those upstream watersheds and mountains to supply 80% of the surface water. If those watersheds aren't healthy and they aren't generating that water, you've got catastrophic fire, you've got sediment and so on, um, that's gonna affect the rest of the system. And then um, demand management. How are individuals within a system conserving water? And uh, obviously conservation, reduced diversion of water, turning on a tap, reduced consumption of water are key to being able to help. So these five factors become very important. And we were asking you know, all the individual parties to look at that leap ahead science and these factors and really do a self-assessment about where they sit. Um, next slide. And, and from that information, um, and there's much more detail in the reports that we have about where the risks and where the vulnerabilities are that lead to those factors, but around stewardship, sustainability, and equity, my staff um, uh, and, and our consultants have helped us to really hone in on 10 major areas of recommendations. And uh, they're loosely tied between two stewardship, sustainability, and equity. Um, but they, in reality, some of these could be, um, you know, stewardship parts of it and equity could be tied very well, um, a little bit like you see the continued research and planning component here. But under the stewardship part of this, we're looking at the need and the large need to just not improve upland watershed health to maintain water flows and quality, but to recover our watersheds. Look at the Calf Canyon, Hermit's Peak fire. You got to do more than just improve it or try to maintain things. We're going to have to recover those areas. And, in or and, and then we have elements of improving health of rivers, lakes, and reservoirs with multiple different uh, sub recommendations on that really important as we go down under stewardship to the bottom part protecting groundwater health um, you have less surface water you have more demand uh, and you have groundwater the natural instinct is going to be to use more groundwater but if that groundwater is contaminated your ability to utilize it is going to be reduced or there could be human health and safety issues with it much a greater focus again on protecting groundwater health because it's such a big part of our supply. Uh, for sustainability, we're, we're looking across the state at modernizing administrative management practices for water. And that framework is actually being taken on uh, to some degree by a water task force that Ms. Anderson is a part of um, that we really will be, be looking at um, trying to, uh, for state agencies in particular, increased communication and coordination across our natural resource agencies. Uh, obviously, continue to innovate in water conservation, 
modernize water infrastructure even more than we've done today. And then for equity, uh, we clearly need to increase our engagement with tribes, pueblos, and nations in water management. They are largely the senior water right holder in many of our streams, including the Rio Grande. Um, we also have issues with uh, um, uh, acequia culture. Uh, in northern New Mexico, we have over 800 individual political subdivisions of the state. ISC has programs that help these acequias. They are probably one of the most threatened um, uh, cultures out there because they're totally dependent on surface water right next to the mountains. Uh, we need to optimize alternative sources of water, cloud seeding, looking at treating of brackish water and so on, and then continued research and planning. Uh, next slide and I'm almost done. So within that, we're, we're just now at the end of June. Um, this last week, we received some input from all of the state agencies that I mentioned, and we're working right now to incorporate that input. Uh, many of the recommendations I just mentioned, the leads for some of those would be other state agencies, not the ISC. So we're making sure we're tuning our language to the way that they statutorily are charged with working and trying to align with them. Um, we have a review that will be going on uh, this next week, it'll actually be early July, of that water task force that I mentioned, tribal entities and acequias. In late July, we'll re re release this uh, document for public comments. In August, there'll be a meeting of the Interstate Stream Commission for a detailed presentation of the plan. Uh, and then receiving public input, and then we'll seek to finalize the plan elements in August and September. That leads into legislative committee presentations and then ultimately uh, the 2023 legislative session. And I believe that's, I have one more slide and that's for questions. Are there any questions? No hands raised. Okay. Well, with that, I mean, I think that was a lot of uh, a lot of information to to digest. Um, we appreciate you being here and just really learning about all the work that you're doing. I think um, Commissioner Quesada had, you know, talked about you know the the use of water just a while back in terms of irrigation and how how we how we address this important this important aspect of our culture and our history here in New Mexico. I think. Um, Acequias are um, um, really unique um, to New Mexico in terms of us um, using that that precious system to to water you know to water our lands and I, and I think you know when we all put our heads together and look at how we can not just this but other means and some of the discussion you know earlier and just talking about our, um, conserving our water through the reservation injection I, I think I mentioned them all earlier about the reuse. Um, we have a lot of work to do, and um, I guess together we're just going to have to make sure that we have a bright future for our for our children and our grandchildren. So with that, um, thank you, and thank you all for being here this evening, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Madam Chair.